Welcome to View from the Shadows. Today is a special event. It is the one year anniversary of this channel's beginnings. Granted, the stories have been sparse this far, but it's been a very busy year. And hopefully the future brings much more freedom. Today's special story, Symbiosis. A tale of a British detective here in America, tracking down a serial killer. They both have secrets. They both share secrets. And they both have a dark past. Enjoy the story. <laughs> <laughs> Symbiosis, Part One The Arrest. Detective Timothy Slocum sat in the dark, watching the house from the driver's seat. In the dull, uneventful silence that was the sleepy suburban side street, he found himself reflecting on all that had happened that led him to this place. He'd been on this case for years and felt he was finally going to catch Anselm Snickel. A task force waited, hidden just out of sight, awaiting his signal. Timothy had driven a rental car this evening and parked it in the driveway of the house across the street, knowing that its common and unassuming appearance would offer him the dismissible presence he needed for this final confrontation. The owners of the house whose driveway he occupied had won an all-expenses-paid vacation, which included the use of a rental car to be delivered the day before leaving. So much of this whole operation had been paid for out of Timothy's own personal savings. Anselm had to be caught. Earlier that day, he'd abducted yet another young woman from a gas station just off the highway on the edge of the city. Anselm's actions were getting more desperate as time went by. He was becoming more and more careless whenever he had captured someone, and this last one was his most bold attempt, having grabbed her out in the open and in front of a witnesses. In front of several witnesses. Anselm's knowledge of the area proved still to be unmatched, and he escaped yet again. Unlike other times he'd tried to escape, however, he had nowhere to hide except his own home which he'd yet to have returned to. The police had found and raided each of Anselm's secret locations over the last few months, and it was believed that he hadn't found another. Thankfully, they had managed to save the lives of a dozen women collectively from these various prisons before Anselm killed them. Their health was in bad condition, but they were now being taken care of. Timothy had been planning this for some time now and had taken every possible measure that could be reasonably accomplished. The plan was to use Anselm's desperation against him. Just over a month prior, Timothy had purchased a van matching Anselm's and had it modified to match it down to the rust spots and dents so that it could easily be mistaken for Anselm's van. This had been hard to pull off since the model of, was very common and one often used as a company work vehicle. He knew that Anselm would be keeping out of sight, but would never leave his van until he'd stashed away his victim. He would sit somewhere and listen to the police scanner before making his move, and this is where the duplicate van would come into play. Just after the sun had set, a call came out over the radio from an officer in pursuit of a van matching the description of Anselm's and was requesting backup. There was a stage accident consisting of a jackknife tractor trailer that had tipped over on the highway to hold up traffic so that the falsified car chase wouldn't cause any unnecessary risk. Even every off-ramp was blocked to prevent a decoy from escaping the highway. This was all given to the media and reported live on both television and radio, all to lull Anselm into a false sense of security in hopes of luring him back to his house. 
Timothy even had someone driving his personal car in the pursuit just off the, on the off chance Anselm would be watching television as well. It was all well executed, and it did seem by the reports that the infamous serial killer would be caught that night on that highway. The trap had been set, and merely needed Anselm to make a move for it to be enacted. A year prior to this night, Anselm had been caught and was taken to trial. Unfortunately, his meticulous efforts and the lack of substantial evidence needed to positively identify him as the serial killer dubbed the psycho scientist by the media, were major factors in his being set free. It didn't help that he was a seemingly uneducated man working as a local delivery driver. He was silent most of the time and fairly reserved for the most part. Everyone thought he was just kind of simple. Concern was raised as to why Timothy was so hell-bent on pitting the murders on a seemingly harmless man. Now that Anselm had thrown the caution to the wind, news of what he'd done had spread like wildfire through the city. Timothy had always had those who believed him, if only because they knew Anselm's secrets. But there were rules to follow, and so they abided by those rules. Timothy ducked down below the level of the dashboard when he saw headlights appear out of the next intersection and waited until the vehicle was in front of him before he lifted his head just enough to see what it was. It wasn't Dan's helm, but another vehicle soon appeared from the same direction. Again, he ducked down and waited. This time, it was a positive match. Anselm's van pulled slowly down the street and stopped in front of his house in the middle of the street. Despite being in shadow, Timothy kept himself as low as possible, while still being able to see with one eye. Suddenly, a light flashed on from inside the dark cab of the van, and Timothy ducked down, his heart pounding, fearing he'd been seen. He could see the light scanning the rental car. As long as he hadn't been seen, the only thing unusual about the car was that it wasn't native to the block. However, it was rented from a company that put its logo all over the car, and it, it was this harm, harmless feature that Timothy was also relying on. After several tense moments of waiting, the light went off, but Timothy knew better than to lift his head just yet. His instincts proved their worth when suddenly the light came back on, shining directly at the windshield. Anselm was methodically, methodical and paranoid in his actions. The light stayed on for just a moment before going back out. This must have satisfied the nervous Anselm as he immediately pulled into his driveway and then his garage. Timothy sat up and stared at the house. He wanted to pull out, put out the call, but he knew he had to wait until Anselm had removed the woman from his van. Tonight wouldn't be the first time Timothy had been in Snickles' house, and he knew that the only place she'd be safe would be in the basement. He also knew from the accounts of the, sev the rescued women that Anselm wouldn't touch them for some time after being taken to some safe point and shackled into place, sometimes being left alone with other victims for days. With this knowledge at hand, he knew that he had to wait because to descend upon the house now may cause Anselm to panic and to use her as either a shield or even to kill her out of panic. And so, Timothy waited with his radio clutched tightly in his hand. Almost 20 minutes later, the garage door opened again, and Anselm's van rolled silently backwards down the slanted driveway without the engine on, until it was clear of the garage. Once he had put it in park, Anselm got out, and closed the garage door before proceeding to the front door of the house. He paused for a moment once on the porch of the aged and somewhat neglected house, and then turned to face the rental car across the street. Anselm lifted his arm and pointed something at the car. At this instant, Timothy yet again ducked down out of sight just as Anselm's, Anselm's flashlight bathed the car in light one last time. This time, Timothy wasn't sure he'd gotten down fast enough. He cursed under his breath. His heart was pounding again, 
and he could feel his pulse in his ears. He had to force his hand to relax as he'd been squeezing the small device pretty hard and had been accidentally holding down the talk button. This worried him because no doubt the radios of the other officers and the SWAT team would have registered the break in radio silence even though no call to move to move in came through. He worried that this would cause them to come flying down the road now while Anselm was still had the chance to escape. However, however slight that chance may be, Anselm only needed a slight chance as he'd proven many times before. Timothy prayed that this wasn't true, that no one had heard anything. He couldn't lose this chance and he didn't want to risk the life of the poor trapped woman inside. The light went out after just a few seconds, and after a second more, he lifted his head just enough to see with one eye. Anselm was standing calmly on his porch, fumbling with his keys. Timothy, Timothy sat back up all the way and watched as Anselm unlocked the door and stepped inside. Sir, are you okay? Sir! Timothy's radio broke the silence with a heavy blow. He moved quickly as he could to turn the volume back down. He must have also turned it up without realizing it when he was clutching it. Sweating from the tension and from being startled, he gazed back up at the house. He couldn't see Anselm standing on the porch anymore, but he could see that the front door wasn't closed either. There was a face staring out at him. Anselm's face. He glared across the street at the rental car. Now! Move in now! Timothy yelled into the radio as he hurriedly exited the rental car. Suddenly the front door flew open and Anselm shot out of the house. His foot slipped on the steps of the porch and he plunged to the ground, rolling several times. Anselm wasn't, going, wasn't down for long as he was soon back on his feet and running for his van. Thinking quickly as he ran across the street, Timothy, gun already drawn, aimed not at Anselm, but for the van. He didn't want to kill him or even risk it. An injury would land him in the hospital, which posed a threat much greater than almost anyone could know, and even killing him had its, had its shared risks with injury. Timothy knew that disabling the van was his only option, and so he aimed at the tires and began firing. Impressively, despite running at the same time, it only took Timothy three shots to take out both tires on the driver's side van. By this time, Anselm had halted his run for his escape vehicle and was now charging at Timothy. With great speed, faster than any normal person, Anselm shot at him and plowed into him. Timothy flew backwards into the air, landing hard on the street just as the squad's car had sped up, screeching to a halt just feet from his head. Before the officer driving the squad car could reach him, Timothy was back on his feet. Anselm was already back inside, door slammed shut and locked tight. Sir, are you okay? asked the officer. Timothy ignored him and began charging at the house. By this time, the SWAT team was already in position at the door, showing his own great speed and strength despite his age and slightly meaty physique. Timothy plowed past the SWAT team and body slammed the front door to the house to the amazement of all those who watched. The door frame and the door both shattered into a spray of splinters and wood chunks as he came to a sudden halt just inside the door. Without much hesitation, despite the spectacle Timothy created, the SWAT team entered the house as police moved in around the perimeter of the house like a swarm of insects. In the future, rumor and supposition would course throughout the ranks of those who saw him break through the door, a door locked shut with eight deadbolts and four chains. Some would speculate that it was because he was so determined to catch the man who'd taken all those women. Those with more fantastical perspectives would postulate that he was, the, was imbued with superhuman strength for various reasons. No one would have guessed what the truth was. It didn't take long to find Anselm. He'd been caught trying to escape through the backyard, attempting to climb over the seven-foot-tall privacy fence that he himself had installed years ago. It took three tasers to stop him. 
Orders had been given with explicit direction that physical contact with him was to be kept at an absolute minimum for health purposes. And so, and so after being handcuffed and harnessed, and a harness forced upon him before he could recuperate from the electric shock, several poles were attached to his harness in order for him to be moved without any actual contact with another person. Meanwhile, inside the house, the SWAT team had split into two groups. One group had gone outside almost instantly after Anselm's location in the backyard was called out. The other stayed inside to search for the recently kidnapped woman, presumably chained up in the basement, and to search for any possible accomplices, although none were known to exist. Every precaution had to be taken. Throughout the entire raid, a woman sat in a chair that looked to be almost as old as she was. She sat in the corner of the living room and quietly sobbed. And although her words weren't captured by any ear other than her own, she repeatedly stammered the words, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I couldn't stop him. This woman was Elika, Anselm's poor mother. She loved him greatly despite what he'd done, because to her, Anselm was her miracle. Her past was largely a secret to everyone, but she considered herself most fortunate to have been able to raise Anselm, because the prospect of ever getting pregnant was, as it was explained to her, virtually impossible. She had tried her best in everything she did, but Anselm, well, Anselm had learned about the now defunct cult of Pars and become obsessed while young. He believed it would bring him power and strength and everything his mother never had nor ever could give him. Unfortunately, his obsession only grew and he began to take more and more drastic measures. He began to believe it was up to him to once again resurrect the great cult and that he alone would lift it to new heights never before seen in its past. Timothy was notified on the radio. And shall... And Snick... Mr. Snickle has been successfully subdued and detained. It's Anne's helm, you idiot. Timothy muttered before he replied. Bring him through, he said with a groan. Timothy stood in front of a wall inside the kitchen where he knew the door to the basement once had been, several SWAT team members standing by his side. The wall looked out of place in that it was mismatched with the rest of the kitchen, no doubt more of Anselm's expert ability. The wall looked just as old and neglected as the rest of the walls in the kitchen, but the paint was just a little too bright. A moment later, Anselm, still weakened by the tasers, was escorted through the back door, also located in the kitchen, by six officers, each of whom held a long pole attached to Anselm's harness. Right as they began to move past him, Timothy suddenly lifted a hand to stop the moving ensemble. Where's the door? demanded Timothy. What door? Anselm said angrily. Don't be purposely ignorant. Timothy retorted and raised a rigid arm at the wall. I don't see a door, do you? Anselm replied with a cocky attitude. Thank you, Timothy said coolly. He knew now what he needed. Almost as if by instinct, he knew that Anselm's reaction meant that the door was still there. Get him out of here, he said. Before the officers could drag him out of the kitchen, Anselm suddenly refused to move. Got a little present for you, Timmy, Anselm said spitefully. He suddenly began to twitch, and in the seconds passing, his chest and stomach sunk in, and his back arched as he made a choking noise. He began shaking like he was retching and with a final cough spewed something at Timothy. A large worm-like thing hit Timothy in the face. It was about seven inches long, sickly greenish white in color with the swamp green veins covering its body. 
and it had a dozen little tentacles that looked like blood-filled rat tails. As it forced its way into Timothy's mouth, Anselm spat another smaller worm at another one of the officers, making the officer drop the pole they were holding. A SWAT team member bashed Anselm in the face, forcing several tentacles to shoot out of his nose. A high-pitched screeching like hundreds of screaming rats filled the room as Anselm cried out. The officer that had been attacked lay convulsing on the floor, while Timothy, on the other hand, stood as if nothing had happened. Once the screeching had stopped, Timothy calmly walked between the shocked officers holding the poles and loomed over the now crouching Anselm. The tentacles retracted back up Anselm's nose with a disgusting slurping sound. You should know better than to try that. We're far too old and too populated to be dissuaded from our life, he said. You're all traitors, Anselm muttered angrily. We're faithful and happy with our place in this world, Timothy said. His voice was deeper, and it sounded like there were countless numbers of himself speaking at the same time. Anselm let out another screech to which M Timothy let out his own. It was more of a roar, really, deeper and more resonant, and with an overpowering volume. That's enough, said a soft, shaky voice. The screeching stopped, and everyone looked to the doorway to see Elika standing there. She appeared so frail that she looked little better than a skeleton. We won't protect you anymore, she stated simply, and then looked at Timothy and nodded. Timothy reached down and effortlessly lifted Anselm to his feet. He then looked around, taking note of each person in the room before speaking again in the same ominous voice. None of you will speak of what you've witnessed here. Not even with each other. Clear? No one responded, and so he asked again. Are we clear? This time everyone responded with varying forms of agreement. Good. Now put him in the truck and wait for me. They began guiding Anselm out, but as they passed his mother, he turned to her and said, We are not sorry, mothers. She looked at him one last time and said with a tired sadness, We are. We are sorry. She left to go back to her chair where she'd been sitting earlier. She knew she would never see her Anselm ever again. And though she regretted everything he'd done, her love for her son wouldn't die. She knew this. And despite his zealous nature and preoccupied mindset, he knew it. Also, but it mattered not to him. As they left the room, Timothy crouched down to the officer who'd been attacked by the worm and checked for a pulse. Damn, he said as he lowered his head. Once the worm had entered his body, his only chance of survival was if his body couldn't reject the worm. Timothy stood back up and turned to the wall. He pushed on it a couple of times and then began punching the wall. The remaining three SWAT team members aimed their guns at it and watched in amazement as Timothy ripped the wall apart with his bare hands. <clears throat> the hole he made exposed a simple framework in front of the basement door. Anselm had built the wall and set it up with preset screws so that it could be fastened into place in front of the basement door quickly. After removing most of the plywood, Timothy grabbed a tuba for in each hand and with a growl began pulling. The wood creaked as he pulled, and with a loud crack, they gave way to his strength. A minute later, and most of the framework was gone, freeing up the basement door. Timothy grabbed the knob and, without turning it, ripped the door open and shot down into the stairs within, the SWAT team following him down. 
Once inside the basement, they shine their flashlights mounted on their weapons around the room to find Timothy already in the middle of the room reaching for the chain. The light flickered on, revealing eight women all chained to the walls. Unfortunately, only three were alive, including the woman he that Anselm had just caught earlier. Timothy walked over to her to find her unconscious and strapped to an old autopsy table. Although this was a good sign, Timothy had a twinge of fear that inside that made him worry. Within moments, the SWAT team had been replaced by EMTs who gathered around Timothy. And he knew all of them by name. Take them all to the internal observation ward at St. Alcapina. As always, keep all of the dead separate. Take the two survivors to Section B, but put them in an observation room, not in the stabilization ward. Take Mrs. Nivekia and give her her own sterile room and seal the chamber. And take the dead man upstairs, too, he said to the group. As they all began to leave to their respective duties, Timothy called out to two of them. Stanvik, Zverkir. Stanvik and Zverkir, two huge men who looked like they were real-life Vikings in paramedics' costumes, turned and approached Timothy. Even with his own height, they towered over Timothy. Have any of the dead lost temperature, or begun to show any signs of decay yet? He asked, even though he knew the answer already. Indeed, both men shook their heads, confirming his already present knowledge. I want you both to keep an eye on Mrs. Nivekia, he said, pausing for a moment to look at the woman on the table. I fear that Anselm had figured out whatever it was he was trying to do, and that despite our efforts, we may very well be too late. I'm reassigning both of you to be her own personal medical team. I already have Adriel's consent for this. Notify us of any changes and make regular updates. The two men nodded and then bowed their heads at Timothy before leaving to take Anselm's newest victim to the hospital. Timothy looked around the room for a second and found another door just under the basement stairs and another fake wall made to resemble the, uh, the cinder block of the basement resting against the actual wall next to it. <clears throat> In his rush to conceal the basement door, Anselm neglected this one. Timothy tried the knob and found it unlocked. Opening the door, he was greeted with a wall of boxes, each containing medical supplies. He knew that Anselm had been getting medical supplies for his experiments, but didn't know where he was getting them or where they were being stored. Timothy left the basement and found an officer he knew he could trust and informed her of the boxes. After giving orders to collect and document everything collected, he turned to leave the house. But before he walked out, he took one last glance at Elika. She sat in her chair, just staring blankly at the door in front of her. His heart went out to her. Her life hadn't been easy, but perhaps now she'd have a chance to gain some form of peace. He turned away and began to leave when she spoke. Thank you. Timotheus, and we're sorry, she said weakly. He didn't reply or even look directly back at her. He merely gave a slight bow of his head with his eyes closed and then left. <laughs>